Colloquiums at Fatma Zana Women University are conducted for faculty, staff, and students with the purpose of fruitful academic and policy exposure through deliberations and discourses by eminent speakers from diverse fields. Dear colleagues, the speaker for today's colloquium is Dr. Nadimul Haq who is presently serving as Vice Chancellor, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, Islamabad. Dr. Huck has wide ranging operational experience of over 22 years at International Monetary Fund, including leading technical assistant missions and policy and research teams, such as a resident representative in two developing countries. He has served as a deputy chairman, Minister of State Planning Commission of Pakistan, and a member of Board of Investment of Pakistan and member committee on privatization. Dr. Haq is well versed with economic analysis and policy development being reflected in over 50 journal papers and two books authored by him. He has extensive experience of public sector and restructuring and central banking and monetary policy. Dr. Nadimul Haq holds a PhD degree in economics from the University of Chicago and a Master of Arts in Economics from the same university. While a Bachelor of Science and their economic performance. Bachelors of Science um, in Economics from London School of Economics. Sir, it is our privilege to have you with us. Now I would like to invite Dr. Nadimul Haq to deliver his talk. He'll speak on the topic, the insanity of our economic policy. Sir, can you please deliver your talk? Thank you very much, Ji. I compliment you people for arranging the colloquium. I'm very happy that we are doing this. Um, three years ago, I did a a book on research in universities, which is available at Wide. If you want it, you can download it or get a hard copy. Um, my concern has always been that we are not doing enough research. And one of the recommendations in that book was that all universities must have colloquiums and seminars. Pied has started a huge series of webinars, as you might have seen. Um, we do about three webinars a week almost, um, because I learned when I went to Chicago or LSE, wherever I went, all foreign universities have webinars every, or seminars, not even webinars, they have seminars. Now it's the webinar age. But they had physical seminars where people would actually come and uh, deliver talks and people would come and listen to talks. And I've been to so many of them in my life. And uh, even today, when I go to the States, I go and attend some of them just for pleasure. And even in London. And I've noticed that these halls are full of people and some eminent people because people do believe that an academic conversation is important. So I compliment you on doing this and I would urge you to do it as much as often and probably even do it every day. After all, what do academics and students do if they don't listen to these things? In PID, we are actually telling students if they don't come to webinars, we will not give them a degree because this is part of their education. It's not a joke. It's hard to tell our students that because they are uh, brought up on bad habits. So unfortunately, people don't understand that, but I'll come to that later. So I also compliment you on your choice of topics. Not that many people realize that we do have an insane economic policy, or rather we don't have an economic policy. But I think a cartoonist knows it better. Can I share my slides if it's possible or not? Where are we? I should see if I can share my slides. Now, Google present now. OK, let's see if I can. Sir, from present now. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. OK, to observe your screen. OK, let me see. Can you see my slides? Yes, sir. You can. OK, let me see if I can do it as a slide. Will this work sometime? Can you see it? Yes, sir. Sometimes if you can. OK, lovely. OK, so I compliment whoever chose the topic. It forced me to think as well. And I love to rethink things. 
I must tell you, I never do the same lecture again. I always prepare myself for a new lecture because that is the only way academics work. If people come to you giving you the same talk, please don't invite them again. And if people come to you without giving you any references or ideas, please don't invite them again because they are not academics. Okay, so let's begin. I think the cartoonist says it the best. I show this cartoon all the time. Those of you who have come to my webinars, you've probably seen this, but let me repeat it. It's worth repeating. repeating. This is our economic policy captured by the cartoonist. And sometimes cartoonists do better than us academics. Here it is, the big bad boy of the IMF, and full disclosure, I used to work for the IMF, sitting on a cart, on a chariot, with the horse as Pakistani policy makers. And the Pakistani policy makers is running helter skelter in a crisis. We are always in a crisis mode. I'll come to that. Why are we always in a crisis mode? But we are. And there are loans dangling, dangling in front of it. If you recall, whether it's Musharraf, whether it's Zia, whether it's Nawaz, whoever it is, whoever the leader, whether elected or selected or whether um, through martial law or whatever, these leaders are always chasing loans. If you get a $10 million loan, there's a picture with the minister standing there and the donor sitting and we celebrate a loan. And then there's a craggy landscape up in front and we don't even know that the craggy, craggy landscape exists. So if this does not convince you that the topic is well chosen, nothing will. But let me go further. We've also got this history of fund program. I don't know whether everybody knows what, a fund, what the fund is. Does, do people all know what the fund is? Okay, let me tell you what the fund is. Fund is very simple. An emergency ward for countries. Do you people like to go to emergency wards? I'm sure nobody wants to go to the emergency ward. I would hate to go to the emergency ward. Yes, we might end up there, but we do our best to not go to the emergency ward. We, those of us who are well-informed try and eat right, try and have vitamins, try and exercise, all in an effort not to end up in the emergency ward. Those who eat in excess, those who don't exercise, those who want to go to the emergency ward every few days, we call them insane. But look at Pakistan's record. Every decade of our history, we have been to the emergency ward. Not once, but two, three, four times. Every government, whether dictator, whether uh, elected or whatever, we have been to the emergency ward repeatedly. That obviously shows there's something wrong with our economic policy. So, case proven. We do have a bad policy. I also show the slide very often. Again, a cartoonist says it best. Note the date. It's from 1950. In 1950, our forefathers predicted Lyakat Ali Khan is walking on crutches of dollars. There's a famous story of how Truman attracted him to the US and put him on his side. And after that, we became dollar addicted. And there are the donors sitting at the back saying, this should prevent him from learning how to walk without crutches. And my friends, we are still there. You are a university, you are an academic institution. If you're not working on this, what are you working on? If the whole of Pakistan university sector is not working on this, what are you working on? The insanity of economic policy is what it is. So when I sit down and listen to Hamid Mir or all these so-called Plato's and Aristotle's of Pakistan who know every subject from sanitation to the moon landing. And they invite their three politicians who also know every subject, PTI, PMI, PML, and PPP. They know every subject, whether it's climate change, whether it's healthcare, whatever. Our universities are never there. Why are they not there? Because you guys are producing nothing. But nobody focuses on this. Hey guys, we've been in the emergency ward. We are donor dependent. We are addicted. It's like we want alcohol addiction we banned. Aid addiction we've adopted. What a country. What a country. I wrote a book three years ago. The title is Looking Back. 
how Pakistan became an Asian tiger in 2050. It's available. Another edition has been put out. It's available on Liberty, on, you know, whatever. It's cheap. I don't not, not writing it for money. But there it is. There are all my things. My Twitter, I'm very active. I've got a podcast. Well, PID has a podcast now. And Facebook pages, etc. so many things. In fact, when I wrote the book, the World Bank actually copied me and did a project called Pakistan at 100. They spent $5 million trying to copy me, and they failed. Their project is dead, but my book is still selling. And people are still talking about it. OK, fair enough. So what's in the book? What's so important? I'm not going to give you a lecture on the book, but I'm going to tell you briefly. Basically, it talks about economic policy, what it should be. And it begins by saying, hey, guys, imagine if you are 50 years ahead, if you're in 2050, let's say. If you're in 2050, what would Pakistan look like? And I take the optimistic scenario, not the pessimistic scenario. Pessimistic scenario is we'll continue like this on dollar crutches, trying to look for aid, not thinking in the emergency world. That's a pessimistic scenario, which is a situation as is. Preserve the status quo. My scenario, I say, if we want to improve, this scenario has to go. How will it go? That's what the book is about. Sorry, not how. What should happen? What is the new system that we want? And that's what economic policy should be about. <clears throat> economic policy, as I argue in that book, has to be based on research. Our newspapers and medias, as I argue in there, our universities are chasing the wrong economic policy. As Keynes, Lord Keynes, I hope everybody of you, every one of you has heard of Lord Keynes. As Lord Keynes said when he was what happened. Lord Keynes said in the 1930s that everybody who thinks he's doing something great. Oh shit, did I do this? Ah oh, Lord, okay. This has happened. Okay. It happened once before. Okay. I'm stuck. Okay. As Lord Skane said many years ago, can you see the slides or not? Hello? Can you see the slides? Because I'm Yes, sir. Up. No, okay, sir. Good, sir. We can uh, see it. It'll be like this. Okay, fair enough. So, anyways, so Lord Kane said 30 years, sorry, 100 years ago, that most people who think they know economic policy, like our news anchors, like our media commentators, like our PTI or PML or PPP politicians, or like our um, army or bureaucrats, they are all these said, dancing to the tune of a defunct economist. They are listening to yesterday's pundits. And in Pakistan, yes, we are. Yes, we are. As I argue in my book and many papers in PID, we did a recent book on development, uh, on P the PSTP, development spending, and we argue in that. We did a few papers, we argue in that. We did a few policy viewpoints, we argue in that. Pakistan still has not come out of the 1960s in terms of its thinking. We did a webinar with Gustav Papanek. Please go to listen to it in, on YouTube. Look at it. Gustav Papanek was the guy who came here and did our first plan. We talked to him. Mahbubul Haq worked on our first plan. The Harvard Advisory Group came and worked on our first plan. From the very beginning, we surrendered our, uh, our economic policy to the Harvard Advisory Group and to USAID. And it was by design. They actually talked about it, how they took over our economic policy. It's still the same. I call that the Huck Hag model. The Huck Hag model was Huck meaning Mahbul Hag, not me. Hag, Harvard Advisory Group. They said, You are short of foreign exchange, you will have to borrow. And they said, You are short of infrastructure, you have to have projects, hard projects, building projects, roads, railways, etc. Well, railways, no, but roads and you know, various things. So we are even today building, we are even today looking for projects. Every headline is PSTB went up, PSTB went up. So our numbers 
game is what everybody plays. You get onto the media and PML baller, PM, P, PML baller, we did the PSTP program was up by 10%. Tax was up by 20%. And growth was up by 3%, you know, whatever. These numbers they think is telling you the story. A famous economic, Frederick Hayek, as I told you, if somebody doesn't quote things to you, he obviously hasn't read anything. I will quote to you deliberately because I want to tell you that my ideas come from somewhere, not that I'm dreaming them up. Dreaming is not research. Frederick Hayek said a long time ago, those who try and impress you with numbers and symbols and mathematics are basically showing off and telling you, preaching to you what is known as scientism, which is not science which is pretend science. Main thing is we must be clear in our concepts and we are not clear in our concepts, sadly. We still are sitting with the Huck Hag model, which says build, 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 forget. For example, we built 200 universities. Yet we don't have a single university because nobody is holding a webinar right now. Right now, if you go to the US, even though it's night time, uh, maybe it's too late now. But if you go to the US at this time, any time, or even UK or wherever, every university is holding a, not one, maybe 20, 30 seminars. Why don't we hold them? Because we have brick and mortar universities, we don't have universities. And you students, you should challenge your faculty, why don't we have seminars, webinars? Because everything you can't get from the classroom, not at your stage. Even children's schools, have field trips and they invite speakers. Why don't our universities do that? Because we are focused on building universities. When I was the deputy chair of the planning commission, I tried my hardest to stop the university, so from, to stop building universities. University vice chancellors got against me. So look, why do we need more universities? Where are the professors? My standard question is still the same. Where are the professors? I wrote this book on that too. Where are the professors? A university is not a building, it's professors. University is not a building, it's seminars. London School of Economics, where I went, is just one building. It is maybe one-tenth the size of Fatma Jinnah University. It has no ground, it has no campus. It is just a building. It's a world-famous institution. Why? Because there are professors sitting there. So anyways, so economics, we have to rethink. Economics is not numbers. Okay? It's more than numbers. Okay. So we've got... Uh, on aid, this book is very important, you should read it, but let's look at our aid. Who makes for policy in Pakistan? Who makes policy in Pakistan? We talked about policy, we talked about policy, uh, we talked about policy. How does policy get made? I won't go into that, it's a whole new lecture, but I want to just raise it with you. Policy is not something that you dream of. In our country, policy they think of as the prime minister sitting down with any bunch of people who come to his room and that becomes a policy. They sit and make policy on sofas. I've been there. I used to do that. They sit and make policy in 15 minutes. Prime minister says, okay, I'll say yes and policy. Policy is not a wish of the prime minister. Policy requires serious research, serious thought, and not just Hamid Mir and not just sitting on, on, on. We, in fact, don't even know what policy is. Okay, here are some examples of our policies and laws. NEPRA. Competition Commission of Pakistan, tax reform, civil service reform, public financial ma management, all the NGOs that we funded and we built, the mortgage law, the mortgage market, XM Bank that we are now building, the Pakistan Institute of Corporate Governance. There are many others. I just picked up these. Anybody can guess what's common in them? I'll give you a prize. What's common in them, my friends? By the way, if you want to raise your hand, I don't know. I don't know. This is now, my, it's not working for me. So just yell and I'll take your questions and comments. Don't worry about it. Just make it informal. What is common in all these things is all of them were written by donors. Our parliament passed them without reading them. Is that what we call policy? Is that what we call independence? So we are independent only to give minister a car and a house and make him feel great. But all the policies are going to be made by donors? Wow. Wow, that's amazing. Even Africa doesn't do that. It's absolutely unbelievable, but there we are, okay? So the book says, hey, 
How will we be successful? The bureaucrats and the policy makers tell me we will be successful by just copying what the donors say. Donors give us a paper, we don't read it, we send it to parliament, parliament doesn't read it, we pass it. You know how laws get passed in parliament, they never read them, they just pass them because ministries had to pass them and that's fine. So donors get everything done for a little bit of money. They give us some money, but not a lot, because that money also gets taken away by uh, their consultants. So we keep copying. So what do the bureaucrats tell us? Bureaucrats tell us, yes. These are standard things you'll hear in Pakistani academia and in our bureaucracy. Don't reinvent the wheel, and it is not rocket science. Whenever somebody tells you these two things, Stop listening, walk out. Obviously, that person is incapable of thinking. The world would be nowhere if we didn't reinvent the wheel. We always reinvent the wheel. Just look at the racing cars, the number of wheels that they've invented. Just look at NASA, the way where they're reinventing the wheel to go to Mars, etc. Just look at the new robots coming out the way they reinvent the wheel. So anybody who says don't reinvent the wheel is just simply saying, hey, stop thinking. I'm too lazy to think. Don't listen to that person. Don't waste your time. Just move away. We need to reinvent the wheel. Pakistan needs to reinvent the wheel. And those who say it's not rocket science, they should know that what we are dealing with is far more complex than rocket science. Rocket science is easy. I used to make a rocket when I was 10 years old. Simple. All you have to do, everybody has it. We've all played with rockets. What is the Hawaii that we use in, on a... On a uh, Shabarat or whatever. That's a rocket. A rocket is easy to make. Dirt cheap. Very easy to make. So what is this nonsense about rocket science? What, do, what are these guys talking about? They do not even think out what they say. Because they are so busy doing this. They are just copying. Nobody who, are, who subscribes to those, these two things is ever going to become a champion. If you want to become a champion, read that guy Gladwell's book. You can't become a champion by not reinventing the wheel, by not treating it as a problem that you have to reinvent and find your space. Right? So Muhammad Ali, when he beat Sonny Liston, Sonny Liston was considered to be invincible. Muhammad Ali beat him by floating like a bee, uh, floating like a butterfly and stinging like a bee. He reinvented boxing his own way. He did not box the usual way. Pakistan, if it wants to get anywhere, has to reinvent itself like China reinvented itself. Not by saying we can copy everything that donors say. China never passes a law that donors give them. Everything is self-invented. Okay? Okay. So, this is the Hakag model. We'll do more projects. We will try and find money from somewhere. So, we will paint this scenario that there is corruption. We'll get 300 billion from overseas. We'll get 500 billion from people in Swiss banks. We got nothing. So we will do social sectors, which means we'll build more universities, more hospitals. We won't worry about quality. We'll eradicate poverty by giving people 3,000 rupees, 1,500 rupees or whatever. We'll continue to end corruption. This is all we are doing. This is, as Keynes said, defunct economics from the 1960s. My former professor, Robert Lucas, and my classmate, Paul Romer, both got the Nobel. Lucas got it in 96. Paul Romer got it last year. They got the Nobel for what? I hope many of you know that. Anybody know that? Can you please speak up? This is getting too boring. I speak myself alone. I can't uh, see anybody. So go ahead, speak if you like. Why did they get the Nobel? Anybody? They got the Nobel for saying that this model is all wrong. That growth is not, development is not about projects, it's not about collecting taxes, it's not about doing all these things that are written here. So then what then is growth and development? 
What then is progress? It is thought. It is ideas. It is innovation. It is entrepreneurship. It is failing and getting up and doing again. It is all the things that humanity has done from day one. How many people died just trying to find out what to eat? People picked berries and found this student that was poisonous and stopped eating it. That was an experiment. They innovated. We have to do the same. Right? We have to have thinking in our, in our universities, but our universities are only buildings. When I tell university professors to think, they say, no, 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 that's okay, we'll teach our class. We've got notes from our PhD program that are 20 years ago, we'll give you old notes. I am trying to stop lecturing. Forget lectures. Let's accept what the rest of the world is doing. Flip the classroom, but that's another talk. But the key thing that both Rob, uh, Paul, Robert Lucas and Paul Roma, Nobel Prize winners, as well as many others, have said, from, all the way from Adam Smith, we have to reinvent the wheel. And economics and social science is more complex than rocket science. Rockets are easy to build. Society is very difficult to build. Rockets, you can copy something on YouTube and build a rocket. Building a society is not available on YouTube. These are difficult things. So there we are, my friend. Okay. This is the background. Now let me do a little bit of thought experiments with you. I do an occasional um, Twitter survey on what I consider the topics of the day. And I hope that some of you will do your research on this. This is what we need research on. This is what we need student thesis to be on. This is what we need student um, students working on. Okay. Government wants... Can the government housing for the poor build, provide housing for the poor without additional taxation and higher fiscal deficits? The answer, most people have it intuitively right, is no. Correct. But has research shown, shown that? Have you guys done a paper on this? Has any Pakistani university done a paper on this? Sadly, no. Right? And that's something that we have to think about. Okay. Universities. Your university too has prime land in Pindi. I've seen it. Universities are prime, prime land. Land is an endowment. Right? Universities are building housing for their faculty in their, with gardens. But they don't make money off their land. Should faculty housing be built on universities? Surprisingly, many people said yes. Why? All the universities I've been to, there's no faculty housing on the campus. Large university, Harvard has none. Chicago has none. Stanford has none. Why do our faculty need housing to be provided to them? Why can't they live in rented houses or buy their own houses? Or why is the university land being wasted? It is, it is capital. It is what the government has given you as a gift. It is a land grant. The universities are begging for money and always saying, oh, we don't have money, we don't have money, but they want to keep the land fallow. And when the land is fallow, like Shabazz Sharif came along and Punjab University took some of the land away. He's even built a road through the campus. Because the university didn't use this land, so the land is open and ready. And somebody in, in Kajim University, a former Senate chairman, has taken over the land in Kajim University. Because we don't understand what capital is. What is capital? Capital is land. Here, we are begging for money. We are going overseas begging for money. But we don't see that our capital is land. We've done a project in PID. It's going to come out soon. You should look at PID research. We do a number of new things. We're doing a project about, which is called, we're just finishing the paper. It's called the wealth of cities. Cities have a large amount of wealth, but all of it is wasted because you don't know how to use it. Right? Growth is about how to using your wealth and not just copying laws from the West. Many of these things that I showed you, for example, we don't need a mortgage law. We don't need an Exim Bank. We don't need a Pakistan Institute of Corporate Governance. We don't need these NGOs. We don't need a competition commission. These are all forced on us and they are budgetary expenditures that we are doing. Why? Because we didn't think it through because somebody gave it to us. Okay. Okay. Government fixes the procurement price of wheat and stores it. 
Should you do it? I'm surprised that 45% of the people say it should do it. That means how bad economic thinking is in Pakistan. Government has been buying wheat all the way since Pakistan was made. Why is the government buying wheat? Why is the government storing wheat? Yes, it provides some bureaucrats with some employment opportunity. Yes, it gives them some rents opportunity, but it's destroying the market. And then we import wheat, or we are always out of balance on the wheat situation. And eventually, we destroy our economy. So I don't see why 55% said leave it to the market. There should have been 100% who said leave it to the market. Wheat is not a market where the government should be interfering. I'm not saying government should not interfere anywhere, but wheat is not a place where government should, because wheat is in surplus in the world. It exists, and you can't deviate from the world price. Why should the government? So these are, again, does the university have a paper on this? Any university? No. Why not? This is the fault of the universities, and this is what my book says. There will be no change unless universities begin to think. If universities are just going to be ratu totas, then we deserve to be where we are, to be in the IMF um, horse running over a craggy landscape. Okay. A government says in immense propaganda that our citizens are corrupt. Are we more corrupt than others? Again, it's so surprising that many people think we are more corrupt than other countries. Why do we have an inferiority complex? Donald Trump's tax returns came out. Everybody knows that he's not clean. But the US is not worried about it as much as we are worried about, oh, we must have clean. What are we? Again, no university looks at this. This is very strange. So if we have, these are the foundations of our society, we have these problems, these things, I just selected a few questions just for the hell of it, but it shows how bad our thinking is, that we think that corruption is the problem. Corruption is not a problem. Atif Mia also did this in, in Twitter once, and he also, with him, um, a very well-known economist from Princeton, he also agreed with me, he said, look, corruption is not our main problem. So what is our main problem? Not corruption. In Competence, incompetence, inability to think, inability to research, inability to understand problems. Okay. Ah, Pakistan is has two hundred universities, but few professors land with buildings. Ministers say university is should be in every district. Should a university be only professors or land building and land? I'm glad eighty seven percent said that it should be professors. But unfortunately, we still think it's only buildings. I don't see why you go to university without professors. In fact, when I applied for LSE or um, Chicago, um, um, it was because of the professors. In fact, let me tell you a little secret. I had admissions to many other universities. I didn't go there deliberately because I found that Chicago and this thing has a better attendance. Better professors, right? Okay. PM of Pakistan has a cabinet announces policy of high rise density which favors mixed use and apartment living. Do you think it should be done immediately? Um, yes. Good. I'm glad 78%. Surprising that 21% said no. I don't know what the, where the hell do these guys want to live, right? But again, do we have enough research on this? Do we? PID has. But do the rest of the universities have research on this? No. Achha, research should be solving real problems and not measuring impact factor. Good. Many people said yes. But hey, HEC is still measuring impact factor. Nobody wants to study the problems that I uh, pointed out to you. But we're doing impact factor research, which doesn't mean a damn thing for us. Nobody cites it. Nobody wants to control it. Uh, nobody wants to read it. So what, what are we trying to do? OK, this is very interesting. We had cricket last year, and they closed down half of Lahore. Nobody could move anywhere. If the state can't guarantee security to allow cricket and business to happen simultaneously, should it not have a cricket match or stop business? We chose to stop business. And I'm still surprised 28% of people said they should stop business. Very strange. Why don't people understand that business is the most important thing? Business is the breadth of life. And cricket itself should be a business. So there's a huge amount of things underlying this that require a lot of research that can be done. Should all universities make quarterly reports to the state of their annual um, of their area of supervision, be it data and uh, ministries? I'm glad 96% said yes. Why don't our ministries make any reports? Why don't they give us any data? 
That's what the job of a ministry is. And we don't know that. Again, nobody researches this, right? What do you think is a bigger problem? Low tax GDP ratio or large wasteful government? The amazing thing is that 37% of the people still think it's a low tax GDP ratio. Why? Because donors have brainwashed us. They've spent millions of dollars to tell us that we've got a low tax GDP ratio. Whereas our tax GDP ratio is higher than what England had when it was at our development stage of development. Our tax GDP ratio is higher than the US in 1900 when the US was even richer than us today. But few people talk about a large wasteful government. Our problem is not the tax GDP ratio. It's a large wasteful government. But do we talk about this? Is there research on this? No. Right? How is policy made in, in Pakistan? Good research? I'm glad few people thought yes. Good, No good research. But pushed by donors and important thing is people recognize. Our, do our leaders, for example, Shabashri wanted to build a metro. What a strange project. Why did he want to build a metro? But he wanted to build it and he built it. We are in a debt problem because of Shabazz's metros. Why did we build the metro? S same thing. CPEC, why did we want to build energy? We, had more, we have more than enough energy. So some people can't do without five or six hours of energy a day. So what are they doing? Is energy a right? I mean, what is this strange way of thinking? And yes, again, universities don't challenge it, right? Some people think that the emperor is the king. If he wants to make a Taj Mahal like the metro, he should make it. So I'm glad many people thought, but 16% still think that he can build a Taj Mahal if he likes. Yet we have no research on this, okay? Okay, look at this. 12 years we've had an energy problem. We lose billions. We've lost 7 trillion rupees in energy over the last 10 years. We, we are still losing two, 2 trillion more. We lose about 500 billion a year. Yet we have not even got a single report on the energy problem that tells us what the problem is. And nobody seems to care. That's part of the research agenda. So in these questions, I'm building up your research agenda. Sugar cartel, we've talked about it. IP, IP, IPPs, we've talked about it. We talked Ricodic. Why did it happen? Was it because of corruption? Or because the government process was bad? Or bureaucrats didn't get it? Right? And you can see the answer is divided. But it's an important question. Why do these things happen again and again? And we don't seem to research them. So the question, my friends, is why are the universities not researching these topics? They are researching all kinds of things for impact factors. They don't answer any of these questions which are affecting our future. That is the insanity of our policy. Then the next question that people come out to me always, so, okay, this is all very great, but how do we implement it? The biggest stupid question I've heard. So question of high implementation, implementation, rocket science, and um, reinventing the wheel, please don't entertain these questions. Question of how is not a question. It is not a question. Question of how is wishing for Aladdin's Sharaf? That hey, give me something that will the genie will do it for me. No. Ideas do things. That's what all the big thinkers say. All the way from the fable of the bees or whatever people talk about it. When you answer these questions, when universities answer these questions repeatedly with research, with a lot of thought, deepening the question, understanding the question, you'll have better policy. How? Because people will learn more. And if you don't learn, you can't have better questions, okay? So what has happened because of all these things that I pointed out to you? Our long-term growth is declining, and nobody seems to care about it. We just say, Bo, Hamid Mira, sir, oh, the GDP growth said 2%, those said, some economists will come along, no, 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 it's 2.3, somebody 2.5. Damn it, they haven't even taken a first course in statistics. It doesn't mean anything. Those numbers are meaningless. This line is very meaningful. The fact that we go up and down, and the fact that we have a Downward sloping line, the fact that our productivity is declining, that's meaningful. Where is your research on this? You're a university. Why aren't you putting out research on this? Okay, this is the second line chart, very important. Our growth rate is lower than every other country in the neighborhood. China is about 40%, India is about 30%, Sri Lanka is about 25%, Bangladesh is about 20%, Pakistan is at 13%, and declining. Everybody else is growing. We are declining. So if our investment is declining, we are not going anywhere. Why is the investment declining? What's happening? Again, no, we are silent on this because we think somebody else will come and reinvent the wheel for us. So, ladies and gentlemen, 
our economic policy is insane because we are not inquisitive, we are not curious. We are just, what should I say, passive people. As I can see from the number of people who are leaving, they're not even interested. Imagine coming to university, your parents are paying money and you're not even interested. I've sat in seminars at LSE, Oxford, Cambridge, Harvard, Chicago. Nobody, everybody's interested. They, oh my God, they line up to ask questions at the end of the seminar. But this is not their fault. This is the professor's fault. So there are deep fundamental flaws in our system. This is what my book talks about. Unless we fix our system, it's not magic. Economic development does not happen as magic. It requires hard work, it requires careful thought, it requires careful analysis, and this can only happen if we work hard to create an academic community, what I call in my book, communities, policy communities, communities of change. They only happen through hard work, asking good questions, sitting through long seminars, trying to understand, not just showing up because, hey, somebody forced you to show up and then you leave the meeting, not even understanding anything. So you can check yourself how many people attended today, how many people understood, and how many people are just there because they want to go to the tuck shop. And sad problem is, in our universities, students are not learners. Whose fault is it? It's our fault. I accept the blame. We have to change this culture. We are trying very hard at PID, but failing. I'm not saying we'll change it, but we will fail, but we'll try. So, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions, I'm here. Thank you very much, sir, for such an enlightening and thought-provoking talk. Uh, I have requested the audience to write the question in the chat box, and I'll be uh, asking on their behalf. Uh, the first question is from Dr. Sajda Naz, uh, who is uh, a faculty member in Behavioral Sciences Department. Her question is, sir, I would like to ask about the extent to which social science research is being considered in the policy making. Even academics or researchers are not necessarily part of the policy making process. I think this gap merges with the direction uh, less research being carried out in our universities and lack of cent centrality of our, our fruit effortful initiatives we take. Uh, the, uh, I'll answer the question. I used to be the deputy chairman of the planning commission. And I told um, all the, um, I used to tell the faculty members, they used to come to me, I, that you don't listen to us. You give me something I'll listen to. Come and present a webinar. I can't listen to people who don't have anything to say. So tell us where your work is and listen to it. But your work has to be there. Uh, the problem with our faculty members right now, like the rest of society, they want to be listened to without the work. And that unfortunately won't happen. You have to show us the work. Another thing I'll say, there are long lags in people listening. When I started working on Pakistan, people did not listen to our research on cities. I wrote my book, main theme, some of the main themes are cities and civil service reform, etc. People don't listen to it immediately, but it takes a long time. Now everybody wants to be talking about cities, everybody wants to talk. So ideas take some time to germinate. But the question is, where are your ideas? Where are the ideas of the people of academia? I'm sorry, academia in Pakistan is silent. And if the silent academia, nobody listens to. If you guys want to be teachers, nobody has to listen to you. If you guys are researchers, then they might listen to you. But it'll take a long time. It won't happen because you wrote one paper. It'll happen when the university system takes out 10,000 papers a year. And when there are about 100,000 webinars a year. Not one webinar, 100,000. Every university should be having webinars. Why are they not having webinars? They're cheap, cheap, easy. Why are your students not sitting in webinars? Please tell me. If the students don't sit in webinars, it's the faculty's fault. Go ahead. Gee. Oops, I can't hear you. Uh, Dr. The Faisal, second question you, uh, is uh, from Ms. Sadia Sherbaz, uh, who is our faculty member and a PhD student at PAIT. Uh, 
Uh, her question is: Do you think data availability and time limitations create an impediment to research process? Not at all. That's an excuse the lazy makes use. Data is available everywhere. Data is cheap. Data is so easy to collect that I, I, I don't know why even academics made, make this excuse. The World Bank is collecting, collecting data on us all the time. I mean, what is ease of doing business? They just talk to 10 businessmen, they make ease of doing business. What is competitiveness? They talk to a few businessmen and they make a competitiveness index. Data is so cheap, so easily available. Look around you, even your students are data. Everywhere data is available, so data is not an excuse. Do you have good questions? Do you have good ideas? That is the constraint. G. Uh, sir, uh, the next question is from Ms. Jore Nayera, who is uh, the faculty member in the Department of Economics. Her question is why economic policies are formally and informally evaluated by government agencies, outside consultants, interest groups, the mass media, and by the public in such a contradictory way that create confusions for patriotic economic agents. Because our academics are missing. The filter is always academia. The filter is your webinar. If you don't have a filter, obviously, then every PTI politician becomes an economist. Every PMLN politician becomes an economist. Every bureaucrat becomes an economist. Here, everybody, including my grandmother, is an economist. My grandmother used to give me economic lessons, too. And she, poor woman, not that she wasn't educated. That's why I raised her, right? She wasn't educated. She was a bright woman. But unfortunately, in the old times, they didn't educate women. The problem is just this. We need an academic filter. We need academic webinars. We need academic thinking. We need academic research. Without that, obviously, everybody's a champion. Hamid Mi today is the best economist. Kamran Khan is the best economist. Hum kare kya? Because the academics are not playing the game. Because we've got lazy academics. So hear me out. Lazy academics. Uh, sir, the next question is by Ms. Saira Tufel, who is a fa faculty member in the Department of Economics. Her question is, uh, your talk explained that it is not only academia policy divide, but also the disoriented research, which may be held responsible for current state of policy making affairs. Would you please suggest a trajectory which can be followed by researcher across the country that may end up in policy making affairs and most optimistically to those so far where policy makers sit? The trajectory is simple. More webinars, more participation, more research. If you have, like right now, after this webinar, I have nothing to attend. Why can't I attend five webinars a day? I like to attend webinars. Hey, it's good fun. It's much better than watching Hamid Mir. Why would you guys watch Hamid Mir and not? I Sorry, I take Hamid Mir or Kamran Khan or whoever. Or what is that uh, lady's name? Asma Shirazi. Why would you watch those guys? Why would you not watch webinars? Why would you not try and learn? If we get that culture going, the, the, in the Western countries, every evening people for entertainment go and listen to book launching. There's a famous bookshop in Washington called Politics and Prose. You can even Google it. It's a very small bookshop, but it has a book launch every day. And people line up for years to get an entrance to participate. Sometimes they even charge you for coming into the book launch because it's full. You have to stand there. There is not even room to sit and listen. You have to stand there and listen to the book. That's the culture that they have. That's why it's a thinking culture. We have not created a thinking culture. We've got these large Punjab universities, a thousand acres right here in Lahore. Kaidism University, I sit on it, I sit on the campus. The bloody thing is 1700 acres and no, they have houses but no web seminars. I think that's a huge indictment. We have to face it. Don't blame others. We have to get active. We have to behave. It's like playing cricket. You play your position. Academics are not playing their position and they're asking for space. You won't get space unless you play your position. And uh, sir, the last question is uh, from Dr. Tahir Mukhtar, who is the chairperson Department of Economics. Uh, her question is uh, how you evaluate the reliability of macroeconomic data in Pakistan. Data is always inaccurate. It is revised two or three times. Um, this year's data will be revised next year. So data is always inaccurate. But what keeps the data honest is if there are researchers who are, who are glaring at the data, examining the, da examining the data, and talking about it all the time. It should not take the IMF to check the data. It should not take the IMF to tell 
us that there was a data inaccuracy and actually fine us, which the IMF did in the year 2000 something. They fined us for being presenting bad, inaccurate data, deliberately lying. I think we we should be, the academics should be the one to look at the data and to refine it. FBS is a weak department, a very poor department. They can't refine the data. But in most countries, the numbers are looked at by academics. And academics actually try and examine the numbers. They have the leisure, they have the time to look at the numbers very carefully. So as I keep telling you, it's like cricket. The wicket keeper is supported by the bowler, the bowler is supported by the gully and the slip, etc. It's the same thing in a country. Policy has to be supported by academia, has to be supported by the media, has to be supported by the people. Now, if you don't make that chain, right now the media has too powerful because the chain is missing, because the academia is not playing its role. And the donor doesn't want the academia to play its role. I've written about that in my book too. The donor doesn't want academia to play its role. But donor is very happy with the dead academia. The bureaucrat is very happy with the dead academia. What is missing in this game is really the academia. If we get the academia active, then maybe we can have a better game. G. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I request Dr. Sarvat Rasool, Faculty Advisor, Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, Fatma Jinnah Women University, for her concluding remarks. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and a very, uh, very good noon to all of you. Um, at the very outset of uh, my remarks, I would like to thank Dr. Nadeemul Haq, Vice Chancellor, Pakistan Institute of Development Economics, for sparing time from his busy schedule and um, for sharing his uh, experiences and his views on the topic. Um, Dr. Huck, with more than 22 years of his experience in the fields of economics and um, development, um, has captured various important aspects of the economic policy and has presented an analysis of the economic and developmental policy. Um, I am sure, Dr. Saab, that uh, your uh, experiences and your um, interaction with the guests, with the faculty members and the students um, has enriched their knowledge and has uh, raised certain questions in their minds uh, for which they would like to find answers to. Um, I just joined the session in when the question answer session was going on and the kind and nature of questions that um, th that people asked and the uh, elaborate answers that you provided, um, they clearly tell how very much interesting the topic was for the, um, for the participants and uh, uh, how keen they are to explore all this. Uh, I would also like to take the opportunity to share that Fatma Jana Women University always tries its best to provide opportunities to its um, faculty members and to the students. Um, to learn from the experiences of seasoned um, speakers. We um, have arranged this colloquium also um, as a part of such efforts, and we hope and expect that in future also there would be more possibilities and opportunities of collaboration and of uh, your interaction with our students and with our faculty. Um, I believe that in the, in the progress and development of a country, the youth plays a very, very significant role. And uh, this session has provided the youth, the young faculty members, as well as the students, a chance um, to look into the issues um, that the nation is facing. And it has provided them a chance to also probe deeper into the issues to think of the solutions for these problems. Um, I believe that to understand the problem and to realize that a problem exists is the first step towards uh, resolving or towards solving a problem. 
and the keen interest of the participants uh, it shows clearly that they are uh, very much interested in understanding um what is going on and what what are and how the threads are moving behind all this um this is more like preparing our youth to face the challenges and to solve the issues that the country is facing and uh, i am sure with these kind of talks and with these kind of interactions um uh, senior uh, people like dr nadeem ul haq would keep on continuing and contributing towards the cause of development of pakistan at the at the forum here i would also um, like to say that on behalf of the vice chancellor of fatma jinnah women university i thank um the speaker and all the the members who attended the session for sparing time out for this thank you very much thank you dear audience thank you very much for joining us in today's webinar i look forward to see you in our next colloquiums as well thank you very much everyone Yeah, that's right.